Trapped by the belief that I'm not good enough, bound by the limitations and the lies that consumed my world, this was me. It wasn't until I took the biggest leap in my life to know and trust the power within. And it was at that moment I made a choice. My past will not define me anymore. Hello, I am Terry Cardula, and I know I am not alone in this. Over the years, I have found that the number one mistake that we make is that we get in the way of our own success story. Yes, I said it. On this show, together we'll tackle limiting beliefs, self-sabotage, getting stuck, fear, doubt, overwhelm, and the imposter syndrome. Join us on this journey designed to transport you beyond your limitations to a world where anything is possible. This is Talking with Terry. Hello, and welcome back to Talking with Terry, where we have powerful conversations to transform your life and your business. And I'm so excited for our guest today, Rodney Plank. She's an award-winning writer and host and producer of the podcast, And Then Everything Changed. She's a native of New Yorker and a former actress who has written in The Atlantic, The IR Review, The Rompus, and The Washington Post, among many, many others. Rodney, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Terry. I'm so happy to be here. I am too. And so let's get started. Bring us up to speed how you got to be where you're at today and we'll go from there. Sure. So when I, so I'm a writer now and I'm also a podcaster, but um, before I had my children who are now teenagers, I, before I got married, I was an actor and I met my husband in LA after acting in New York. And I never really thought about writing very much except for my sister who is a writer and a TV writer told me you should really write. And so I did end up uh, writing a monologue or two for theater. And then I stopped. And after my second child was born, I started taking classes in fiction writing. And I soon after that began to publish short fiction. And then I started moving over into nonfiction because all these essays about my life growing up with my mom having left to follow a guru uh, kept bubbling up. And so then I started writing these really personal essays, which then later became a a memoir, a full-length memoir that I drafted in graduate school for writing. And um, it's it came out in May. It's called When She Comes Back. And it's about the loss of my mom to the guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh twice when I was growing up and our reconciliation. And the interesting thing about Bhagwan is some, some of your listeners might know him because there was a Netflix docu-series called Wild Wild Country. And he was wow. the, at the center of that. And so my, my book has a lot to do with what it's like to be left by your parents, what it's like to give up your power, how you feel okay about yourself and how you come of age when there are these vital pieces in your family missing. And I also took that interest and that curiosity to my podcast and then everything changed because I feel like there was a time in my life where I spoke a lot and talked a lot and felt like I was on stage a lot, but didn't give room for other people to express themselves as much. Yeah. Um, I, I think like I talked, therefore I was. And somewhere yeah. along the line when I became a little more vulnerable and worked on my own issues and my own defensiveness and my own marriage, I sort of pivoted and started to take in more from the people around me. And that's why the podcast exists the way it does. And that's why I wrote my memoir the way I did, which is to sort of open up a conversation about what it means to, to survive stuff and to then be vulnerable in your life. Wow. I love it. We're very similar in a lot of ways, because I think um, I've shared the same thing. It's where, you know, when you, when you're driven to do certain things and it's like, okay, I can get focused on my stuff and in, in speaking versus allowing others, you know, to share their stories and, and, and their, their experiences. And that's, that's kind of funny. Cause I, that's kind of why and how this podcast started as well. And it was like, I wanted to hear more people's, you know, child, you know, challenges, but in the sense of, you know, we all have our stuff, right? We all have our stuff. And I think sometimes we, we put people on pedestals. We put people on these, um, gosh, they got it all figured out. Yes. And that's not the, that's not the, that's not as a therapist for, you know, over 25 years, I just knew that that was not the reality. Mm -hmm. You know, we can put on a great face and we can put on a great front, but that's just not the reality of what's happening. 
No, I really feel, I feel like there's almost, my father growing up, he raised me, used to always say there are two kinds of people in the world. And then he would divide people into everything, you know, yeah. people who wear jeans and people who don't wear jeans. But for me, like there's two kinds of people in the world in a sense. And it's the people who have sort of woken up to the fact that uh, you have to kind of go through the muck and you have to address your own behavior and patterns and the people who aren't yet ready to do that sort of yeah. and i feel like once you've done it you can really see and, and i don't mean it in a judgmental way but you can really see it in the people who haven't done it yet because there's sort of this difference in behavior and being in the world that is a little more closed off and i feel like in the podcasting world you know at least with the people that i've connected with like you and i just went to a podcast conference called she podcasts and it was really great to meet all these women who were kind of like walking the walk you know and yeah. and i don't mean to and i'm very I'm very aware of coercive and high control groups. That's definitely something that I'm not interested in. So I'm not talking about the lingo and, you know, the high pressure sales stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about authentic showing up and having real conversations. Yeah. So speaking of that, what has been kind of your biggest challenge, kind of just what you've shared kind of in your path, what's been the biggest thing that you've had to overcome? I think uh, among the things that I've overcome at the at the root of my main main issue is probably the what what my behavior and bad patterns and relationships stem from is a lack of belief in myself and a lack of belief in my worth, which if anyone has studied parental attachment and secure attachment, I lacked secure attachment growing up in my childhood. First, my father left and then my mom left. And, and I didn't register that as a kid like, oh, this is why I'm acting this way. And this is why I'm yeah. having a hard time falling in love. And this is why I don't trust people. But I think that when you feel that you're inherently not good enough or that you're inherently leavable, then you behave in your life in a way that's to defend from that kind of pain, right? So once yeah. I started to understand that it's like a weird dance, we are responsible for our own behavior and how we conduct ourselves in our life. But we also have to remember that the way someone treats us is really more about them than it is about us. So that balance yeah. between looking at myself and putting myself under the microscope to see what I'm doing, but also accepting who I am and that I'm okay the way I am, that's been the biggest help for me. Yeah. And that's a process, right? I mean, that doesn't happen overnight and that's a, that's a journey on its own. Um, because I think sometimes we, there's so many outside factors, right. And how we're parented, you know, the, the, the peer groups, I mean, everyone has an influence in our lives in a positive or negative way, or even just in a, in a neutral and different way. Right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what was, what was most helpful for you in that journey? Um, can you repeat that? I, I yeah. lost that one. What was, what was, what was the most helpful in your journey yeah. to have that insight and awareness to shift that? Well, I would say that for me, um, I really had to do work with my husband and, you know, we had to meet each other in an honest place without anger and to really accept where we both had made mistakes. So it's kind of that same idea of staying put, not running away, looking at myself and being brave about it. And I would never have used the word brave because, you know, I don't, I don't think that I would have associated that with myself, but it's to understand. And I know that vulnerability is a very often repeated term these days, but I did not understand six or seven years ago that vulnerability is strength. I didn't understand that vulnerability is something you do that is courageous and to be vulnerable yeah. to be vulnerable you know we talk a lot about it Brene Brown talks a lot about it it really is not for it's not for the faint of heart to be vulnerable means to stay put and to be able to really look at the the behavior that you're you know that you're perpetuating to see how people are treating you and to figure out what you what you might need to look at yourself and to be vulnerable is also to say that really hurt me or you know I really I'm really missing, you know, X, or I really wish you would X and not in an accusatory way, but you know, it yeah. really hurts me when you do this because I feel like blank. That's takes a lot of strength to do that because it's so much easier to kind of put up the drawbridge and, and block everything out and be independent. And I will also say that 
my MO is secondary answer to this, your question, my MO was always to be self-sufficient because I learned early on that I had myself to depend on. So it's easy for me to go into robot mode. It's easy for me yeah. to just decide that I've got it all handled and to become sort of like very type A and not let things in. But I have two children. I have a husband. I have, you know, people in my life I care about. And so they they want the real me, the part that you know, is messy, the part that doesn't yeah. have it handled. So I had to let go of that armor. Yeah, that's powerful. I love say, I love what you said, you know, vulnerability is strength, yeah. right? I mean, I think sometimes we we're, we're taught the opposite, you know, and I think for a lot of, mm-hmm. for a lot of time, we've been taught like, oh, you don't show your weaknesses. Don't do this. Don't do, you know, and yeah. it was interesting. I had this conversation just, um, a couple of days ago and, um, someone was saying, Oh, I have to have it perfect. I have to have it like scripted. And like the video has to be like, at some point there was probably a need for that, but nobody wants that anymore. Like nobody wants, like people want to see people making mistakes. People want to see your authentic self. People want to see, you know, that you're not perfect and, you know, flawless. I mean, people want to see authenticity in its, in its finest. And it, and it looks sometimes messy and it looks, yes, you know, um, you know, not polished, but that's people, you know, want to see the authenticity. I through. also think curiosity has been really important. So I recently was at that conference and I was a co-panelist about interview and interview techniques and how to get the best from your guest as an interviewer, because I interview people for articles that I publish and I interview people on my podcast. And this also was very integral in what I've learned because curiosity is so powerful too. And what I mean is curiosity with the vulnerability, because you, you, I'm sure a lot of people have been through that experience where someone asks them a question and you answer the question, but you can tell the person who asked you is already on to the next question in their head, or they're already thinking about how your answer affects them and about their life. And, you know, the give and take that's required in a really meaningful or satisfying conversation, because it doesn't have to be meaningful. It could be anything. It could be about pet food, right? But that idea of connection, really letting somebody into your space and your understanding so you can really roll it around in your head and figure out what does that mean to me? And and what do I want to say about that? The courage to be quiet enough to let what they're saying wash over you, you know, that is authentic too. Yes, that's powerful. That's absolutely powerful. So what would you say has been, you know, um, some of your life lessons? Yeah, my life lessons are that um, I, I, I think I was sort of born into this, even though my mom didn't really know how to mother me when she was when I was young. I have maternal instincts and I feel really strongly about taking care of children, the vulnerable animals. If you if you're a creature or a person who can't take care of yourself, I my heart lies uh, like the most powerfully with those who can't speak or, or help themselves. And so for me, my life lesson is to always treat others with respect and to always try to understand that people are going through things that you may never understand, that everyone has something happening in their life that you may not understand. And, you know, this is a funny thing. This is a small life lesson, but I've reminded about it a lot. Recently, I've been on the phone with people to help secure medicine for one of my family members. And there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of back and forth and conversations and call this person and wait on hold. And it's really frustrating and the old me the new york the new yorker me (laughs) really used to really in my 20s be aggressive and feel like the only way i was going to get things done was if i really showed them that i meant business and that i was really tough and like like a strong strong wall but what i've noticed is that it happens more naturally to me it's not necessarily calculated but i am talking to these people on the phone like they're people and like they have a life and that they're doing a job and that they're doing their best and they might be frustrated too. And I've had just like the most interesting, calm conversations with these women helping me on the phone. And it reminds me of that Yiddish term, which is mensch, which which literally is translated to gentleman, but it really means to be a good person in the world. And the more you're a good person in the world, the more I feel people will be good people to you. And it was so interesting to me because 
it's happened to me again and again where I'm just being calm and patient and letting people know when I'm frustrated and saying this is really hard or this is this is really frustrating or oh my gosh I'm so confused or I'm worried and people respond to that I'm just not trying to be big and large and in charge I'm I'm yeah. telling people wow I'm just a person trying to figure this out and that really helps it's a, a giant lesson for me in my life yeah and well and being vulnerable in it right like not having your barriers up and not having to be right and not having to yes force yes it. And I <laughs> yes, and I can tack on to that. You know, at the end of my talk uh, last week at this conference, we were talking about how you talk to guests who may not make it onto your show, um, which would, would this would translate to anyone who you've interviewed for something that, you know, they're not going to get. And so uh, we were talking about the correct responses and someone said, well, I just don't, you know, sometimes I just don't respond or I don't let them know. I just go on with my show and I don't tell them they're not going to be on. And this one woman, she spoke out of the audience. She said, that's not, I don't like that. That's not that's not okay. That's, you really can't do that. That's not cool. And I was like, you know what? And I just stopped what I was doing. I said, you're right. I said, you're right. That's not okay to do. It's, it doesn't, there's no integrity in that. And on the way out, this woman came up to me and she said, a different woman, she said, wow, you handled that slap down. She used the word slap down. You handled that slap down really well. And I was like, what slap down? And, and she saw that as a, an audience attendee member kind of, you know, basically undermining me, but I didn't see that at all. I saw that as someone saying, you know what, wait a minute, that's not cool. And I was like, you know what, you're right, that's not cool. And yeah. and I and I approached it with vulnerability in action. And can you imagine what my talk would have been like if I'd been defensive and if I'd been, yeah. you know, snappy with that person because she interrupted me and my train of thought. So that's yeah. what I mean about like walking mm -hmm. the walk. And, and I was so happy to see that that came out of me naturally. I wasn't calculating it. I wasn't like, uh-oh, yeah. I've been <laughs> caught. Let me figure out how to look <laughs> like a nice person. <laughs> Yes. Well, and I think it's like about setting the default mode, right? And when we reset the default mode, practice makes progress, right? Mm. And so the more we practice that skill set, the more practice that we get into like being more vulnerable. And I think that's something that I continue to work on is being more vulnerable because I think, you know, again, you know, there's, there was a time in my life where it's like, I had to have everything perfect and I had to have everything, you know, just so. And I think I, I, I now joke that I am a recovering perfectionistic <laughs> yes. being. And, and so I can, I get, and I know, and I can sense when, you know, I'm, I'm going back into that tendency, but it's, it's resetting that default. It's resetting, you know, and reprogramming those scripts, those reprogramming, those habits, reprogramming, re reprogramming that behavior yes. that we've done in the past. And, and a lot of times that, that behavior got reinforced. It got reinforced yes. in lots of, lots of different aspects and avenues that it got reinforced by. And now it's like, okay, creating a new habit. We have to be conscious of it. And then pretty soon after we've done it enough, right. Yeah. It becomes our new defaults. Yeah. And I wonder Which, sometimes, you know, with our generation, I think you and I, we might be in the same generation. I'm not sure, but I feel like with these young, the Gen Z's and the millennials uh, and millennials aren't as young anymore, actually, it's, know, like, right? you know, it's more like the Gen Z's, but, you know, I wonder if they're going to be able to cut through some of that noise. Uh, Cause I think some of the way I was raised was definitely the era and the generation, you know, parents did not in my life say, I'm feeling nervous and scared and I want to do the best for you. Like never, it was, yes. you know, just like, I've got this raw, but um, at least with my father. And so with me and my kids, I'm trying to be more open and, and um, a little more transparent. And I wonder if these 20 something is coming up now, hopefully if they're kind of, um, you know, basking in all of our vulnerable, you know, in all of these platforms where people are trying to be honest and clear and straightforward, if that will rub off on them and we can save them some trouble in their 20s. Because I think some of what you and I went through has a lot to do with being younger too. Yeah, I agree with you. I hope so. I hope so. I hope that that's the message that <laughs> we're trying to help you. <laughs> we're trying. We're trying to be a great role model, right? We're trying to like influence, you know, that in a positive way, right? Learn from our mess, you know, learn from our challenges, yes. learn from our messes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what would you leave the listeners with as far as like some tools, tips, tricks that you learned throughout your journey? that could be valuable for them to start to implement into their lives. Okay. Okay. Here's one. And I think I might be recapping a little bit. Um, it's not about you. Most of the time, the way someone is behaving and treating you 
doesn't have to do with you. It has more to do with them, but how you respond and what you do with that behavior has everything to do with you. So you get to decide how you're going to shape that. I also want to say that you can turn most situations around if someone's rational and, you know, a decent person, if you're not getting what you want from them, or you're not having an interaction that feels good, you can slow you can slow down the pace and do some real active listening and really try to get a sense, use your instincts about what they want, what it is that they're after. And you can in a way calm them enough so that you can get your message across about what you need. But the main thing is connecting with people. That's really what I love to do. And I am not like walking around trying to be like a connection uh, pariah, but I do try to really see where people are. You know, it's, I think the sociologist in me, um, you know, really just check in with people and really, you know, one, one or two uh, honest and real heartfelt points of connection with someone can shape the entire conversation, your entire relationship. It can slow someone down and disarm them enough to really be there with you. And so you can get a sense of what they are and it can really change your your whole experience with someone. Um, also that you can always change and you can always grow. You always can. Um, I'm doing it all the time. I see myself going back in my old habits. I have to catch myself. We are fluid and plastic and we can change all the time. And if I, the child of many divorces in my family, the child of parents who did not know how to parent, who did not have good boundaries, can stay married to my husband after some rocky times, can mm -hmm. learn enough about my mom to be close with her now and have a decent relationship with my mom closer than we ever were, even though she left twice when I was growing up, then I believe that people can, can perform miracles in their own life. Wow. I love that. Like a hashtag boom, right? Like, I love that like, way, to, way to wrap that up for us. So powerful. So where can people connect with you? Where can people find your book? Um, Thanks for yeah. asking, Terry. Um, everything is under my name, which is Ronit Plank. And so I have RonitePlank.com where you can get my book. You can support a small uh, press, a small uh, bookstore. You can get it on Amazon. I also recorded the audiobook myself. So if you, well, in a studio, but it's my voice. It's six hours of listening. So if you like audiobooks or you like Kindles, it's available that way too. And also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, I'm all Ronit Plank. And I'm on Instagram all the time. So if you want to see old photos, if you want to see some of what I post about relationships or what I'm working on, I have another story collection coming out this spring and I have another book in the, in the works right now. So all that stuff is on Instagram and on my website, Ronit Plank. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your, your words of wisdom today. And just thank you for, you know, pushing forward and continuing to become a better person. And I think that is a profound message, not only for your family, your kids, but for all of us that we can, you know, take that and, you know, incorporate into our lives. So thank you. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. So great to talk with you today, Terry. I am so grateful that you joined me for this episode. If you've enjoyed this, then there's just one thing that I would like you to do. Click to subscribe and leave me a rating and review. As my way to thank you, let's connect for a free consultation. Just reach out to me at talkingwithterry, that's T-E-R-I dot com to book your time.